<laughs> okay, I think. Uh, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, yeah, let's okay. let's, we'll let's kick it off. Um. Yeah. So I suppose let's start here. Um. So hi, folks. Uh. I'm surreal. Uh. My good compatriot Nate is somewhere over there in the ether. Um. Wherever wherever Nate is, and uh, we'll be presenting today the second in the second iteration of the lecture series for CEDH University, and it's been titled Tackling the Gap, Building a Bridge to CEDH. And that's a title that we've come up with, and you may have seen from early promotional material that this lecture was actually entitled Tackling the Gap, Making the Jump to CEDH. And in doing so, we wanted to change that title just a hair, because it was really important to us that building a bridge indicated that moving from wherever people start to wherever they end up is a fluid and flexible journey, right? So that if you start in point A, you can move to point B, and you can also choose to go back. Um, making a jump by its nature is an expenditure of energy that takes you from that point A to point B. However, it leaves you at point B and many ways forgets or requires you to ex then jump back, asking another expenditure of energy to then go back to where you started. And we really wanted to communicate the idea that EDH is a format and CEDH is a part of that format. So when you build a bridge, wherever you're coming from, when you come to CEDH, you can go back there. And whatever you place you want to define and settle upon as your comfort zone, as your EDH home, you can start there and you can go to wherever else you like. And so wherever that bridge wants, you want to build a bridge to and wherever you want to let that bridge take you, you can. But when you do so, that it is not just a one-way journey. It is, in fact, a two-way two -way street, right? Sure, you got to pay a toll going down one way on that bridge. But do you, you don't always have to pay the toll coming back. And that's really what we wanted to get across when we adjusted that metaphor from some of the earlier iterations of what this lecture looked like. So with that, we're going to move on. And we're just going to start with a brief introduction, both who I am and who Nate is, and a little bit about where we come from and how we ended up here in CEDH land. And a little bit about what we've done since getting here. So Nate, take it away. Tell us a little bit. Of, that's the wrong way. <laughs> Nothing like a scuff stream to start the day off. So uh, I started playing Magic in 2015 with the release of Fate Reforged. I, uh, I started out like most other people, just goofing around with friends. We're playing in the cafeteria uh, before school started. And uh, after... After a huge gap, my friends finally drug me over to their house to play Commander. Uh, put, put a scrubby Jota deck in my hands, and away I was. Uh, I played ADH Commander com very, very, very casually until finally picking up CDH in last year, 2021. I, uh, I really enjoy mid-range creature combo attacks, and... Simic is my life. I love, 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 love blue and green. No worries. But uh, yeah, as, as I was saying, I'm surreal. I use they, them pronouns. Um, occasionally, uh, he, they pronouns. And I started playing Magic in 2008. When I say started playing Magic, it's really a loose term. It's kind of, if, if anybody grew up with playing Yu-Gi-Oh cards, you did not understand that you actually had to pay costs and sacrifice things in order to cast your very fancy blue eyes white dragon that you had you just kind of did it because it was cool and you had the card similar to how i started playing magic where i ignored mana costs i did not know what lands did i thought they were boring because i had no text um so realistically my magic's journey really kicks off in 2011 2012 when i started playing right at the tail end of scars of mirrodin block and right at the beginning of dark ascension and innistrad the first cards i ever purchased was a full playset of every common and uncommon i don't know how i got my hands on it but every common and uncommon all four of them in um dark ascension and that's where i started so i actually started in 
Esper playing Esper Spirits. But with the release of the EDH precons, the first set of them in 2012, a lot of the folks in my playgroups picked up EDH. And with them, I went as well. So I started playing EDH in 2012 and very quickly shifted into CEDH. Though I did not actually have an idea of what CEDH was at the time, um, I simply understood that there was a very mean uh, Azami Time Twister Lab Matory Maniac Mind Over Matter deck that was, was destroying me on turns two and three, and I was not actually getting to play the game, so I decided to go looking for ways in which to take my Rurikthar deck, which I had picked up as soon as it, I had opened a copy of it in Dragon's Maze during the pre-release, and I said, I need to find a way to make the blue deck suffer. And that's kind of been my motif for about the last decade, <laughs> is finding ways to make non-creature-based decks suffer. Because uh, that's what my color pair does. So I really enjoy playing aggressive mid-range decks. I really love the color pairing of Gruul, although Jund, Naya, and Mardu are actually not far behind, as long as it doesn't have blue. Um, I really adore goblins. I adore everything about the color red, whether it's direct damage, or the goblins, or the haste. Um, and people may know me from playing Rurikthar. I've been doing it for literally since I started. Um, and nowadays I'm very happy and honored that the deckless database has my list up on there for Rukthar midrange. However, and we'll get to this in a little bit, currently I actually don't play Rukthar that much anymore. I'm currently playing Minsk and Boo Timeless Heroes, which is probably the newest Gruul deck on the block. And we'll get into a little more about what maybe informed me and, and said, yeah, you know what, it's probably time to switch. But we're going to talk about exactly what that looks like and when we decide to switch. And so as, we mentioned, as I mentioned earlier, when, when we say build a bridge, um, these are some quotes, these two quotes here are actually things that when I was talking with the administration crew for CDHU, I said, you know, this is kind of what I want to do. And this was informed largely from a Twitter discussion that I actually was fortunate to get dragged into where Pops was talking about, hey, you know, we're looking to create this initiative that teaches people who perhaps have no idea what CEDH is and have only heard about it in name. And they say, well, we want to get into that. That sounds cool. You know, that scratches my competitive itch. And Shivam Bot on the CAG sort of stepped in and said, hey, you know, I'm all here for this, but I am concerned what it would mean to really, if people start to flock towards CEDH, you know, what does that do to the casual spaces? And as someone who perhaps I think made a jump, and I use that term specifically because when I, when I jumped into CEDH, I left behind a lot of my inklings and my joys of what made me happy about casual. And it took me a long time to sort of rediscover that. And in doing so, there are lessons to be learned from stepping into CEDH and the ways in which you're able to do that, as well as the aspects of casual play. And I want to be able to make sure that wh wherever you start on your journey, that you start there and you be able to progress forward and move towards whatever goal you want without being able to forget where you've come from. So that when you look back at where you started, the things that got you started in magic don't leave you. And that's sort of why we say building a bridge. I've gone the wrong way again. I'm probably going to do that a lot more. <laughs> so this kind of brings me to this idea of there's a cycle for CEDH. There's not, this isn't always a 100% you know, scientific law that I'm talking about here. This is more of Generally, where do people end up into EDH? How do they get there? And I can really speak to my own journey in large portion, which in conversation with various peers and folks in the community, both casual and competitive, this is a lot of what the average journey looks like is you play casual EDH. You, know, you somehow get into casual EDH and you say, you know what? I've heard about this thing called EDH. I'm interested. I want to know what it is. Nowadays, you know, CDH has a name. There's an idea that at the top of the format, 
there's this group of players, this community that pushes everything to the absolute limit. And that, you know, perhaps may be appealing to you. And you're saying, well, I, maybe I want to get into that. So how would I start getting into that? And you start looking for resources. Perhaps CDH University and this lecture itself is one of those resources. And we're hoping that in looking at this, this will then this lecture will begin to inform you and educate you about what your next steps are. And those next steps, at least in, in my perspective, is once you understand what CEDH is in concept and the ideas, the mindset, the, the language that gets used in this community, you can start to actually pick a deck. And you want to pick a deck that you like, not explicitly because it's good or it's not good, but something in that deck speaks to you. And you can pick up other decks. One of the benefits of CEDH is that many playgroups are incredibly proxy friendly. So you can, or, or just digital friendly, you know, Moxfield, shout out to Moxfield, has a great play tester in their deck building website. And that very easily can be adjusted through a variety of free mediums to effectively saying, you know what, I can build whatever deck I want, regardless of price, and I can just pick up and try it. And you can pick up and try any number of decks and see if these work, if, if those work for you. And once you kind of settle on something, you can then move to piloting your deck and growing as a player. And so you're saying, I have a basic understanding of what this deck does, how it wants to win, how it gets to that point, and how it perhaps prevents other people from winning or more, you know, at a very basic level, how, I, how do I not lose, right? And all of that is, is things that you want to use in growing as a player and in that stage. And Charles, bless his heart, gave a fantastic lecture uh, at the beginning of October this month, uh, the year is 2022 for anybody on YouTube who's watching this. Um, Charles gave a great lecture about how to grow as a player and preventing plateauing. Go check that out if you want. We can probably link that in the description or you're literally on the channel if you're watching this, so you can just go look at it. Um, and then for me, at least, I found it was really important that CEDH didn't scratch all of my itches. So it was important to me to say, well, I want to go back to casual. And one of the difficulties in that was I had spent so much time learning about what competitive meant that it was really hard to go back. And so one of the questions I really want to answer in today's lecture is, can we comfortably play on both ends of the spectrum? And if so, what are things that we can do to get to that point? So that EDH is a format, and you have this, you know, you have this meta here at the top end of the spectrum. And I use meta specifically, despite the fact that many people will argue that it is, in fact, a meta. But at the end of the day, it's all EDH. There's, only, there's a reason that competitive EDH has one letter in front of the name of the actual format that everybody plays. And encapsulating both sides of, those, of that spectrum is really important because you cannot have one without the other, in my opinion. And some people will disagree, and that's fine. In which case, of course, that's why the question section is here. So what, how do we get there? You know, there's, there's a lot of these terms that are being thrown around, such as you may hear people saying, oh, CEDH is, you know, is overly powerful, it's, it's bad, or high power, you know, what is high power casual or nitro casual versus CEDH? What is casual even? There's a lot of hemming and hawing about what these terms actually mean to the people in the community, and you'll get a lot of different answers from a variety of different people. And there is no real one answer, but what Nate and I are going to try and do today is kind of give you an idea of like, when people say X, this is what we've seen. And when people say Y, this is what we've seen. And so the three cards here on the screen, you have an Assemble the Legion, a Birthing Pod, and a Demonic Consultation. And to me, these three cards are kind of indicative of the three levels of EDH, where casual, Assemble the Legion. There's nothing super fancy. It's splashy. It's I'm I'm going to really out myself as a competitive player here where I say it's a little expensive. Like five mana is a lot. And because like for five mana, you get Adnaws. And Adnaws usually wins you the game. Assemble the Legion, if left alone, can win you the game over time. But Assemble the Legion, for me at least, I remember that was one of the cards when I started playing really early on, was like gate crash. I was like, damn, Assemble the Legion is the real ish. It's like you will lose the game to assemble the Legion. Now, mind you, 
my understanding of the format was very different, and this was in standard. And Assemble the Legion was fine. It wasn't great, but it was really cool. And casual, I feel, is, you know, it has that space. Um, you know, uh, there's there's a couple of friends of mine who always refer to casual as sort of goober tier magic, where you can play your six mana 12 12s with no evasive ability and just say, I'm going to cast this thing and I'm going to bonk you with it. And that joy, whether it's to play your big dumb idiots or your draft chaff or your flavor wins or you're just your favorite cards there's space for all of that in casual and when you push when you start to crank up the heat a little bit and you push into high power things get really muddy um one of the things that nate and i discussed when we were preparing this lecture is that when people say high power they don't there's not a real clear distinction of high power versus cedh other than well i just couldn't afford to play the moxin right and the Moxin, for some reason, and, and these fast, expensive, fast mana rocks seem to be the only thing that prevents people from sort of making that jump. And we'll get to a little bit about, well, let, let it not prevent you. You know, we're going to get to that. And I always think of Birthing Pod as a card that I could see existing in a casual list, and it's a card that I could see existing in a competitive list. And not only that, it does exist in competitive lists. Uh, so Birthing Pod lovers, perhaps this is a place for you. But Birthing Pod gives you that sort of space of it's not an unconditional tutor and it's not so incredibly fast. It still requires mana, but there's mana cheat and, and it's intricate and there's a lot of things to like on both ends, both extremes of this spectrum. And then you have Demonic Consultation. And personally, I don't think there's a way you play this card and it doesn't feel a little bit unfair, um, especially because it's always often paired with Thassa's Oracle. And that, to me, you know, things like Underworld Breach combos, Lion's Eye Diamond, Demonic Consultation, to Tainted Pact, Thassa's Oracle, that all feels distinctly like competitive EDH to me. Because, as Nate will touch on very shortly, there's this idea of streamlining versus optimized. And when you push it to the absolute limit, certain things are going to cut it, and certain things are not. Um, and yeah, it's like Nate, if you want to, sp you know, if you want to speak to that a little bit more there. Well, so we'll, we'll kind of dive into that here in a second, but sure. Um, what we're really going to kind of get into here is what exactly is it that makes CDH so powerful and kind of gatekeepy in comparison to more casual play, like even when you're playing high power or battle cruiser. If, uh, if you catch my drift. And so if you ask any competitive player what the CDH rule zero is, uh, they're going to tell you that, well, we've all agreed to play to win. That's what separates competitive from casual. Casual players will, will rule zero out in their social contract. Land destruction, uh, sometimes even counter magic. Some players believe that they're virtuous for, for playing decks with blue and having no counter magic, which is, you know, fine. However you want to play is however you want to play. But when we play CDH, there, there are no, no bars. You can play whatever you would like as long as you have a very, very, very good reason uh, for doing so. And I think playing to win is a very, very loose term that we kind of fail as a community to define because it can mean a lot of different things. Like uh, here before you, I have a Gretchen Titch Willow list. At the time that this deck was built, I would have told you, I was convinced that this was, this was a competitive deck. I was like, wow, I really want this commander and I want a competitive deck with it, which we'll discover here in a minute that it's not really. Um, I, you know, if I'm in Simic Colors, I have a commander that draws cards. So it's a very easy combo outlet. And here in the list, we have tutors, we have counter magic, and we have a way to combo and win the game. Which is not necessarily something that casual lists do. Uh, a lot of casual players will discourage infinite combos or even non-deterministic loops that could just flop. 
And so why, why is this list not competitive? You may say, I, uh, I took this in and I played it a, a very small handful of times, but I really thought that this is what I wanted. This is what I wanted to build. This is what I wanted to win with. And after playing it a little bit against like real competitive decks and even in some casual pods and high power pods, I discovered that this deck was just not it. You know, I, I can't just throw tutors, counter magic, and a combo into a deck and call it CDH. And so here is where we diverge into what it actually means to play competitively. So what we really mean when we say play to win is that we are optimizing. We're trying to optimize our chances of winning the game. Not, not optimizing fun. Like, granted, there is a certain amount of, of fun factor, which we do take into consideration when we, like, pick the kind of decks that we, that we like. We, we don't really play things that we don't also find fun. And so the, the list I was playing was definitely streamlined. I made the most powerful deck that I could possibly think of, and it just was not good enough. So I kind of want to draw some comparisons for you on our optimization mindset by making a very, very simple look at Thrasios Triton Hero, which is a tried and true, confirmed, competitive commander. Uh, they have the, the same mana cost, Gretchen and Thrasios. Uh, their, their stat line is a little bit different. Gretchen is a 0-4 and Thrasios is a 1-3. This is going to be mostly inconsequential, but Thrasios can kill other creatures in combat, which is a, which is a slight bonus because it may be a little more challenging for your opponents to run over you with a bunch of 1-1s one because they will lose something every time. Uh, already in the text box, uh, Thrasios activation costs 4 generic mana, whereas Gretchen's costs 2 and a green and a blue. Uh, colorless mana is far easier to mass produce and have excessive amounts of than colored mana. So already off the bat, Thrasios is easier to activate and actually use. Uh, his ability also says scry one. The card selection here is huge because for four mana, Thrasios can scry one to the bottom and then draw. So you get to see twice as many cards potentially for the same amount of mana. Um, and they they both can drop lands into play. Gretchen kind of has the, uh, well, I'm bluffing that I have spells because I'm not putting lands into play off of my ability. Uh, I, I truly think that twice as much card selection, you get to see twice as many cards, is way more powerful than bluffing interaction. And uh, lastly, at the very, very bottom, we see Thrasios has partner. Um, this is pretty big too, which we'll get into here. In a second, um, if you want to go ahead and move to the next slide for me, please. Uh, the colorless activation cost, like already out front, means that just playing Thrasios at the helm of the deck by himself instead of Gretchen already gives you an additional combo with Kinnon and Basalt Monolith to mass produce colorless mana to activate Thrasios an arbitrarily large amount of times. So already in, in terms of, of comboing, Thrasios is the more optimal commander because it is easier to combo with him than it is to combo with Gretchen. And uh, here we have, on this next slide, we have partners. So partner is a huge mechanic in that you get to add colors and another commander that also has text. So Zerda... For example, if you also had access to red and white with Thrasios, becomes another combo tool with Basalt Monolith to mass produce colorless mana. So you have another combo tool in the deck as opposed to Gretchen, who can't use this. She just doesn't have access to this. And you get to play more generically powerful cards like Doxi Extortionist, who is very easy to loop with for infinite mana with, say, Emil, while also just being a generically powerful card. Got treasures being worth twice as much if you have a Kinnon in play because they tap for double mana. 
Or you could even advance into different color schemes, like with Vile Smasher. So Vile Smasher gives you black and red, so you could still play powerful cards like Dockside Extortion, just like before. But this gives you an alternative Storm Avenue with Ad Nauseam and Underworld Breach. And finally, like Surreal touched on earlier, uh, black for consultation. Delana Consultation and Tain Impact is a very, very easy A plus B with Thassa's Oracle to win the game, which is ultimately our goal. We are trying to win the game. That's what we really, really, really want to do, is win. There's something to be said for the fact that um, when we say we're trying to win the game, that is not just... There's an idea of you can win the game, but how do you want to win the game? Because even at the end of the day, like Nate's explaining here, is like, yes, we want to win. There is the rule zero conversation in many, many different tables of CEDH's high folks were playing to win, as, as Nate said. And yet despite that, Despite the the arguable claim that many people say, well, Blue Farm, uh, for for reference, folks, Blue Farm is a Timna and, um, oh my gosh, it's I'm blanking on his name, Timna Krom. I I just played against it last night, but Timna Krom is uh, white, black, red, and blue, so sans green, four colors, partner pairing, and many people argue that well, it's Grixis plus white, and that series selection of colors is the objective best set of colors in the form in in the entirety of EDH. When you push the power level all the way up, that's the best thing you can do. And yeah, like sure, that's the best in slot. And yet, it has taken only it has been only recently that Blue Farm actually put up things like tournament results. And many people said, "Well, what's happening here? What is it that what is it that people?" don't understand why isn't blue farm winning every single time and a lot of that comes down to um you know in in a slight divergence here from the topic at hand is cdh right now is arguably one of at its most diverse point that it's ever been in the history of this way of playing edh and that's good that's actually fantastic because it means that for you, perhaps, who may be new to the format or just trying to get into things, it's a fantastic opportunity to find any number of different things that may appeal to you that make that you know you look at this card and you look at the strat and you say, that appeals to me. This is fun. I'm excited to play this. And that may be Oracle Console, it may be Oracle Pact, it may be Underworld Breach Lines, you know, it may be any kind of producing infinite mana of some in some way or shape or form and then throwing it into a Thrasios. Or you may be a bit like me, where you said, you know what? I want to play CEDH my way. And to touch on si- something similar when, when Nate was talking about Gretchen Titchwillow, uh, I mentioned earlier that I don't play Thar anymore, despite having done so for a very long time. And that, in some part, comes to this idea of... Um, and I'll, I'll get to the slide in a second, but this is actually a really great option of what are things that make me happy? And, and, and Oracle Console and playing counter spells and interacting heavily on the stack did not necessarily make me happy. And so Thar made me happy. But at a certain point, I had to understand that Rurik Thar at its core is a six mana six six. That's really hard to cast very early when most of the game actions are going to be largely concentrated in the first three turns of a pod. And so trying to think about that gets you into this idea of, okay, I can streamline, and I can optimize, and I can push this commander to its absolute limit. And it may even be CEDH viable. And yet the year is 2022. And unfortunately for myself and all lovers of Rurikthar, Rurikthar just doesn't cut it anymore. And so that's why I've switched a different commander. You know, I finally have options outside of Rurik Thar to play the way I want to play. And I'm staying competitive. I'm maintaining the mindset. I'm pushing all of my cards to the limit. And one of the things that is sort of innate, you know, in, innate in playing CEDH is that you're looking at the meta. You need to understand what is everyone else playing? 
and what am I playing? And when those two things meet, what's going to happen? Rurikthar, at its core, looks like a casual card. The deck list, if you looked at it, looks like a casual list. And yet, it was able to function into competitive pods because I was able to tailor and tune and focus in on the fact that EDH, CEDH is so heavily reliant and interested in non-creature spells, whether that's fast mana rocks or free counter spells or looping things like Lion's Eye Diamond or Wheel of Fortune or Brain Freeze, anything like that. And if I can make you take enough damage, doesn't matter how many cards you draw, doesn't matter what obscene combos you're going to pull off, if you're dead. And that is this idea of you can play things that you want. Playing to win and optimizing doesn't mean that there's objectively a quote-unquote best deck in the format. There's a lot of people that will look at Blue Farm and they'll look at Winota and they'll go, Blue Farm has all of the best cards, and yet many times it loses to Winota. Why? And the answer is because Winota wants to attack things in a certain manner. And this brings us to the meta of CEDH, which has a meta. Now, when you jump into CEDH, you're going to be there with that meta. But as, I see, as you see here on the slide, once you've made that jump, you want to be able to not just jump, but you want to be able to walk back to where you started. So if you're coming from casual, one of the thing, here are a couple of things that I recommend as, as a longtime competitive player who is now only recently really starting to learn again about what casual means. So when you play competitive, you're going to be playing decks that are trying to execute the same game plan over and over and over again. Why? Because it's efficient. Why? Because it makes you win the game. And your goal is to try and win the game. So what can you do that separates competitive and the things that you are trying to execute in competitive pods from the things you're trying to do in casual pods? So one of the things that I found a lot of success with was cut your tutors. Especially things like Demonic Tutor, Vampiric Tutor, Imperial Seal, Grim Tutor. Anything that lets you find whatever card you want, try cutting those from your casual lists and see if that works for you. Not, this is not a series of ultimatums that I'm passing down. You know, like this, These aren't commandments on stone tablets. These are ideas of if you are moving into CEDH, and you're coming from a space where you either are playing high power casual or you're just playing normal casual and you're looking to shift into a more competitive mindset in some of your some of your gameplay try embracing a less competitive mindset when you aren't in those competitive pods and so that means cut your tutors embracing your pet cards again like seriously there's all like magic is supposed to be fun if you're not having fun what are you doing, fam? Like, you have, there's a million things that you could do in your life that are way more productive than magic if you wanted to just not be fun and still, like, get something out of it. So if you want to have fun, and that's not to say competitive isn't, because competitive scratch is one type of itch for me, right? It's, it's a type of way of playing magic that says, I'm looking to push everything to the limit, and that's fun for me. And yet sometimes there are days when I get home from work and I go, you know what? I really don't want a cash. I like, I really don't want a competitive pod tonight. And I'm just looking to like play things I like for me. That's usually playing a pile of goblins. There's really no reason why the goblins are in the deck. I could just pick up a pile of goblins and say, you know what? This will make me happy. And that being said, there are sometimes instances where you want to go as fast as possible, right? In, in competitive pods, you are trying to win as soon as possible in a lot of ways. Like Unless you're like a control deck or a stack deck or something, even still, speed and time is, is, of, is of importance. And trying to limit your infinites. You know, staying, staying away from A plus B combos. Uh, aiming to just play single target removal. More board wipes. You know, th there are things that just don't show up in competitive games that you're probably going to miss out the more you start playing competitive. I, one of the things you realize, or perhaps in my case, I'm very grateful for, is that you just don't have board wipes in, in competitive very often, which is why decks like Rurikthar or decks like um, Thrasios Timno that are heavy on creatures 
look really great because if you don't clear the board, they just get to sit around and accrue value. And when you get to accrue value and interact and hold up mana to do so and pay a very little price to to get all of that, you know, you create these games where you are able to interact. And interaction always creates for interesting games because it means that there's push and there's pull. And many ways, both in competitive and casual, you have that push and that pull. And so moving past that, let's get down to the nitty gritty. You know, why you you're here. You're here at this lecture to try and understand what where can I learn? What can I do to get into competitive EDH? And that brings us to some resources. There's a lot of really great resources that we've more so now than ever before for the competitive style. And that's through the blood, sweat, and tears of this community. I am immensely grateful to the people who put this stuff together, whether it's the primer writers on the decklist database or it's people like Timmy T1000 putting together things like the budget bruised resources or, or even it's Ken, you know, putting together the CDH guide. These are resources and websites that I, I can pull up in a second here to really show you the ropes, right? If you are in a play group that doesn't have any competitively minded folks and you're looking to just get your feet wet, where can you start? So there's a couple of, of options. So you can, my biggest recommendation is start with the three websites that I've listed here at the bottom. You've got the Deckless Database. This is not the end all be all. It's not, but it's a really great resource that is constantly curated and always being looked at to just say, where can I start? I want to know what decks I can pick. What are my options? What works in this end of the format? What works for CEDH? And the Decklist Database is a great place to start looking. It has any number of deck lists with their matching primers and their deck discords. There's a lot of deck and archetype specific discords out there. It takes a bit of hunting, but places like the Deckless Database and Budget Brews and the CEDH Guide all have links to that. Even in CEDH University, where this lecture is originally being streamed, has links to many of these. I know on, on the Budget Brews website, there's a Discord library of all of the various discords for specific places like the you know i run the gruel discord personally and there are places for you know the gitrog monster discord the yisan discord silvala bro storm there are places for blue farm there are places for thrasios evolution decks there are places for um there are even more places like the CEDH Nexus, uh, and some of the more um, quiet servers that are really great places to just learn to play, right? I know here in the CEDH University that we've got options for play spaces, but also in Nexus, if you're looking to play somewhere, Nexus has a great and super friendly community of folks that are just there to play games, and that's, that's its primary purpose. It's get people together to play CEDH. and if you want to get your feet wet and you want to just get some some games with randos and start somewhere and you're just like, I need to play somewhere in EDH, I want somewhere to play CEDH, the Nexus is a great place to start. Um, now, podcasts. Podcasts are great. However, in many instances, because podcasts are opinion pieces and they are the opinions of whoever, you may not always agree. So I, I caution you to say, you know, Try some of these out. And there are more podcasts out there. These are some of the ones that I listen to. So I like the Into the North guys out of, out of Toronto. Uh, Sad Nas with Adam is fantastic. He's super swell. Um, and the Play to Win podcast. Those are just a smattering of options. But CEDH in large portion has been so integrated with the development of discords. And so that a lot of the resources and the information that you need to have to even get your feet wet 
has kind of been encapsulated in those discords and were kind of locked away. So if you didn't know where to look or somebody didn't tell you where to look, it was kind of hard to find. And that's what Ken's guide is really great about, is that Ken is trying to make, uh, and the people working with him are, are trying to make this resource for the community of people like yourself, perhaps, that say, where do I start? And the, gu the CDH guide is a great place to do that. Now, this then brings me to there's there's kind of a big elephant in the room of, oh, good God, competitive EDH is prohibitively expensive. And to that, I say proxy, proxy, proxy. The best thing you can do for yourself and your wallets is proxy, proxy, proxy. CDH is incredibly proxy friendly. As long as folks can read and understand and acknowledge what your card does, that's about it. So. Do not fear price and expense and cost as a reason to not play CEDH. And if, let's say, your, your LGS, which doesn't allow proxies because it's sanctioned play, is developing and you say, you know what, hey, guy, you know, hey folks, I want to put together this, um, I want to put together some CEDH decks. Does anybody else want to join me? And people go, ah, I don't know, you know, I want to play here in the LGS, but I can't afford the thousands of dollars to build something like blue farm. And so um, shout out to Timmy T 1000 for the CEDH budget brews website, which is a fantastic resource with a multitude similar to the necklace database. It has a database where it's a list of, Hey, here are all of these different CEDH decks that in many ways are proven and actually show up on the deckless database in many ways, but also some that don't where they try and take the most optimized version of a CEDH list in terms of you ignore price and you pay for, you, you just play what is, whatever's best in slot. And it tries and looks at it with a, a budget conscious mind. So it says, you know, I, I, I'm only willing to spend, let's say a hundred dollars, or I'm only willing to spend $500 or 300, or maybe you're, you're, you're really, you know, you've got money bags over there and it's like, you know, what? I can, I can splurge. I've saved up money. I'm ready to get in CDH. I can spend a thousand dollars. What does that get me? And the Budget Brews website is a great place to say, hey, I've got X amount of money. What will this get me? Where can I start? And it gives you a lot of options at different price points to get into this format. Um, other than that, one of my personal favorites and a place that I tend to hang out a lot is um, Josh from California uh, has Mind Muscle Magic. And, and you've, mentioned, you've heard Nate and I mention Charles um, also known as the mono white guy, Ilvaldi on Twitter a couple of times. And Charles is a great community member and, and resource for, for people looking to play EDH, uh, CEDH. And he and I and, and a variety of other fantastic community members hang out in the Mind Muscle Magic server. And that server is really great if you just are looking for sort of the feel of an LGS with a lot of people that focus specifically on competitive commander. Um, and yeah, so so Nate, if you've got any ideas of like places that you like to hang out for your discords or or other places for resources that you've got, um, you know, welcome welcome to shout them out now for sure. Oh, not I spend a lot of time in a in budget brews, but I'm also a member of of Mind Muscle Magic. <laughs> I, uh, uh, I don't really get to play as frequently as I'd like to over there. Yeah, so um, if you're looking for discords, also. We'll we'll be providing links in the description uh, below in this video for a lot of these discords and websites and these podcasts if you want to go and look these up. Now that being said, okay, great. That's how you that's how you move over towards competitive. But what about casual? Um, and I'm looking at casual from the perspective of someone who plays a lot of CDH and has been for a long time. And so everybody knows the command zone. If you like the command zone, that's great. If the command zone is for you, that's good. As a long-term enfranchised player, command zone has kind of outgrown its usefulness for me in terms of their podcast and in many times their content. That's not to say I don't like it. I just don't think that if you are looking to play competitive, in many ways, it asks that you have a deep understanding of the card pool and EDH as a format. And the command zone is not really targeted at Enfranchise players in that way. So I want to like kind of look at something somewhere else. So one of the places that I really cannot shout out and, is, and has been one of my favorite podcasts to listen to recently is Casual Magic with Shivam Bot. 
And Shivam has a selection of guests ranging from the most casual players to the most competitive players anywhere along the spectrum. And he does a great job of exploring not only the aspects of magic that make people happy about like, you know, this is why you play that game. This is why that person plays that game, but also the different things that make these people people. Um, Shivam does a great job at sort of encapsulating magic players as people. And, and that's one of the things I want to sort of focus on when I talk about casual, I'm not talking about any which way to play magic. I'm talking about people who play magic because it's fun. And we love this game because it's, it's a hobby and it's a getaway and it's a community that we love and enjoy. And so a lot of the podcasts that I have listed here on the casual side are podcasts that really sort of celebrate the gathering aspect of magic to sort of use that hokey little style of a you know, little bit of wordplay there. Um, so casual magic with Shiv and Bot and humans of magic with, uh, with James and James, does a wild job. He has some of the most prolific players as guests and just people who have shaped this game from a 60 card competitive format and just getting to know these people as like where they come from and who they are. Um, and similarly, you have Gathering Stories, the History of Magic, which is less so about the physical game itself and the cards and the tech and more so about the lore and, and how the game kind of comes to be as what it is today. Um, and then also, friend of friend of the friend of myself and, and many others here out here in the community is uh, Hobbs, who runs the Goblin Lore podcast, which tries to look at magic holistically from the perspective of you know focusing on mental health and and the different things that we magic players surround ourselves with. And then of course the EDH Rec cast. You love them or you hate them? Who knows? Um, shout out to the EDH, EDH Rec cast for always. I somehow find that they always have something, even for me as someone who's really played this game a lot and read a lot about it, and I think about it at a pretty different level than someone who just wants to slam six sixes into each other. I'm really trying to think about the game, and they always find a way to teach me something. And though I don't always agree with their viewpoints, I find that it's really enriching to always try and learn something from folks that you may not agree with and just sort of trying to walk across the table in some instances, even if at the end of the day you say, that's not for me, fam, but you go ahead and knock yourself out. Other than that, support your LGS folks. I know that the professor says it all the time on his, on his, on his videos and it like kind of has taken sort of almost a meme status, but, but seriously, go out to your LGS, go play commander there, show them some love and really cultivate these communities. At the end of the day, magic is pointless if you don't have people to play it with. And supporting your LGS is one of the best ways that you can find people to play with that are local to you. And I know that everybody's still, you know, whether you're completely out of COVID yet or you're still trying to stay at home and be safe, fam, there's just, there really isn't anything that beats in-person paper play with magic. Um, spell table does a great job of sort of capturing a little bit of that magic, but no pun intended. It's really hard to, and it's really fantastic. So, you know, groups like eminence and Monarch, uh, who are putting on these tournaments for CEDH folks out there in the wild in person, if you can make it out to one of those tournaments and they're local to you really super appreciate that. And, uh, and love that you're supporting these, you know, grassroots movements to just give people things that they've been asking for, you know, which is a tournament scene for people like-minded folks like us for, for competitive. Um, other than that, that just about pretty much concludes our presentation here from Nate and I. If anybody in the chat has any specific questions they want to ask us um, or not, um, other than that, I know for people here on YouTube, uh, you may not be able to actually directly interact with us here in the chat. So if you have questions for either Nate or I, absolutely hit us up in CEDH University. You can find both of us there. We've got the mentor role. You can um, you can find me on Twitter as well at this is surreal underscore. Um, I'm occasionally frequent there. You can also catch me in the Gruul Discord. I'm always there trying to help people out master this color pairing. Nate, where can people find you if they want to? they watch this video and they say you know what i got questions i want to ask this nate guy seems super cool i want to know more about him maybe i want to play some games with him where can people find you where can they catch you 
Uh, I'm not really active on social media, but you can find me very easily on Discord through CDHU or the CDH Budget Brews servers. Perfect. Yeah. So um, other than that, um, thank you so much for having us here. You know, it's been an absolute pleasure and an honor to be able to speak to you all today. And, you know, I hope you go out there and kick some ass. If you want to play competitive, absolutely more power to you. This format is actually, despite the price, incredibly accessible. And the community here is trying to make it as as accessible as possible and really tear down tear down the walls of of, of gatekeeping and, and trying to understand it's like oh well you know i don't know anything about it that's very quickly disappearing and the information and the resources out there are just they go above and beyond and so no matter where you're starting from and where you want to get to if if where you want to get to is cedh and playing on a consistent basis you know there are so many ways in which you can start doing that now. And we've only touched the, the tip of the iceberg in today's presentation. So, um, yeah, I hope that y'all have a fantastic day. And uh, questions? What do we got from the chat, folks? So we have a question from, uh, from Timmy asking us to elaborate more on Streamline versus Optimize. I'm going to kind of ask that he gets a little bit more specific with that question. For sure. I guess uh, basically any deck can be streamlined to function quickly and efficiently. For sure. It really is optimizing where we're looking at each individual card choice and it has to have a purpose. How is that card helping us to win the game? But optimizing to win looks different depending on what kind of metagame you play in and your yeah. own player skill. Yeah. So, you know, touching on this streamline versus optimizing thing is like Nate said, you can streamline anything. Um, anything can, you know, from, from the most basic bad, bad is a very loose term here, but like there's no power behind it. Some of the old legends, legends like Sulkanar death keeper, that card doesn't do anything really um and technically yeah it's in grixis i think right i think it's in grixis so silken art like you could make a grixis pile out of it and you could make it competitive like you could put oracle you can put breach you can put all of those lines you can put all the counter spells you can put all the fast mana that doesn't explicitly make it to edh because at the end of the day you're not pushing it to the absolute limit. You're not pushing it to the pinnacle of what you could do with the resources available to you. And that's why, at the end of the day, you sometimes there, there's a term for... I was an English major in college, and, and there's a term in writing called uh, killing, killing your baby. And that sort of, as morbid as that sounds, killing your baby sort of means... No matter what you, you know, no matter how much you like this thing that you're enamored with, this con this concept, that you you have to at the end of the day, when you are producing something for the consumption of others, or in this case, when you are trying to make something that you're going to play against others at the highest level, you sometimes have to kill your baby, and uh, that means, sure, this is a card you really like, you know. Gretchen Titchwillow, right? Gretchen Titchwillow is a card that Nate pushed to the absolute limit. And that card is not bad. It does a lot of the things that Thrasios does, but it doesn't do everything that Thrasios does. In all of the ways in which Nate elucidated, you get to a point where you just can't do anything else. And it just stops. And the only thing you can do is just acknowledge that the card that you have is not best in slot. And this other thing that you perhaps are not playing, either by choice or because you're not aware of it, is in fact better. Um, there's, there's a story on my end of when I was playing Thar, one of the reasons I, I got to a point where I said, I was told this card, I, was, I, I looked at Dragonborn Champion and people said, maybe this card is good. And I said, I don't know if it is. And, and I listed all of the reasons which I thought it would not be. 
And one of the things about CEDH is that because it's more objective than casual, and in many instances, the pilots at the table are trying to make the best decisions they can, that means that you are less likely to get errors based on on opinion or preference or spite or salt. And so you get a much more um almost like almost like a science experiment. You would have less variables to worry about. And that means you can make more objective claims and arguments as to why certain cards are good or not so good. Um and and Nate, if you want to take this question from Timmy, Timmy asks us here in the chat, uh lovely to see you Timmy. When you are trying to streamline, how do you know when you're at the point when you need to optimize? So when you're streamlining a deck, it's it's probably coming from a more casual standpoint where you're like, oh, well, this is the commander that I want to play and I want to build the strongest version I can possibly conceive. And you only really get to the point of I need to optimize because you really never really need to optimize. But if we're playing competitively, where our goal is an optimized win rate, then only then, when you're trying to optimize your win rate, do you go, okay, I need to objectively look at all of my card selections and optimize, make them as best as I possibly can to suit the meta that it's playing in. Yeah, the 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 question of um, suiting the meta that you're playing in, right? Metas can change. There is the generic idea of what a CEDH meta looks like, and there is also what your specific play group and the people that you end up playing with on a regular basis, what their meta looks like. One of the things about Mind Muscle Magic that I personally love is that it has a lot of stacks players. It has mid-range players. There's not a ton of turbo decks, and that means that the games that you get in that server versus somewhere else look very different. You know, places like um, if you have a pod and it is an Agila player and a Blue Farm player, a Winota player, and then whatever the heck you're playing, that's going to look very different than a pod that has Gilead Ballista and Rorik Thar and Thrasios Timna and Winota, right? Winota's the thing that stands the same between these two different examples but one pod or even you know what let's let's make it even simpler you're playing a pod you sit down there's no blue decks at the table none that sans blue pod is going to feel very different than a any pod with even the slightest amount of blue because it means that people are just not going to have the dearth of interaction that you're going to have if someone at the table is playing blue because there's just no real access to counter spells. Yeah, I know there's Pyroblast and REB, but those don't even work unless there's blue. And there's Tibble's Trickery, but that doesn't even really count. Um, so that's an idea that you have to consider when you are trying to optimize. You are looking at meta. Meta becomes a thing that you actually have to think about when you're talking about EDH because if you just build for... Uh, like I, this is probably what I'll see, and you ignore what you're actually seeing. You're not optimizing. You're just you're you're playing for a false meta that doesn't actually exist for you, which means it basically doesn't even exist. Um, because if you're not playing it, it it's not there. It, it does not affect you. And one of the there's an idea, there's a story I like to tell about. I played a pod where somebody showed up with um. Oh, goodness. It's from Ikoria Chevel, Bane of Monsters, which is a Golgari 2-drop with bounty counters. It draws cards. It's not super relevant. But basically, they pushed that commander, and they said, this is Golgari stacks. I'm going to include all of the fast mana and all of the, you know, the brutal orbs and the rocks. It's got your Trinisphere, your Tangle Wire, your Winter Orb, your, your uh, Static Orb. And yeah, at the end of the day, does the deck function in a competitive pod? Kind of, sure, yes. But because that person made the choice to play Shovel Bane of Monsters, as well as a number of other pet cards, those various pieces within the deck that are not the optimal best in slot 
or whatever the strategy. I mean, sure, you can make Golgari stacks. Nath exists. You know, Nath of the Guilt Leaf is a deck that people play that is actually viable within competitive spheres. Shevel Bane of Monsters is not. There's a reason for that, and that's because Shevel doesn't do anything. One of the best places that you can choose to optimize in CEDH is change the damn commander. If your commander, which is a card you always have access to, and in a style of play where you are looking to mulligan aggressively, your commander is a card you will always be able to cast, presumably assuming you have the mana, you always, are gonna, you, you always have access to it. That means that it's a card you are going to see every single game, and in many instances, CEDH is even more reliant on its commander than a lot of casual pods are. Because your commander often either offers you card, the card advantage you need to stay in the game, or it just offers you the outlet. Like, Thrasios does both of those. That's why it's so good. Kinnon lets you do both of those. That's why it's good. Uh, gosh darn it, I'm naming Simic cards because the Simic cards are cracked. Uh, but other than that, like, yeah, it's... You need to make these choices where you can't just say, oh, I'm playing it because I want to. I mean, sure. But then you're sacrificing percentage points, and those percentage points begin to add up when it starts to directly impact the flow of the game. And when you are make when your card choices impact the game in a way that is not with the intent of I'm trying to do the thing that helps me win the game, and you're doing a thing because you can. That's not always CDH is not the space for that in a lot of ways because it will throw off what everyone else is trying to do. Because CDH is not this vacuum of you versus another player, it's you versus the other player versus another player versus another player, which now are all facing each other as well as teaming up at different points of the game, to try and stop someone who's ahead and, and jockeying for position. And in that jockeying for position, if you are trying to contribute and help and you decided that oh, I can cut a counter spell because I can throw in something else that I just objectively like and isn't actually that good. Well, the fact that you're not playing one more piece of interactional removal is now directly impacting the game. And that means that a game that doesn't have to end and you can still try and win, you have sacrificed percentage points to just say, I guess I'm just going to lose if that happens. And that's not the goal when you're trying to play CDH. You know, like Nate said, you're trying, you're, you're really trying to win. You're making your best concerted, good faith effort to present lethality at all points in the game if you can, as best as you can. Um, so yeah, that's a really long, you know, that's a really long answer to what Timmy's Timmy's asking here. Any other questions from the chat, folks? Uh, I know that, um, pop, I, if you're there, I know we've been running for about an hour now, uh, a little over, um, if there are any more questions, fantastic. We'll answer them here. Otherwise, uh, Nate, anything you'd like to close with? No, I, uh, I think we've just about covered all of it. Great. Yeah. And, and, um, that about covers it for me. Thank you so much again for having us folks. I uh, hope you have a great rest of the day. And hopefully, uh, I look. We look forward to seeing catching you in a pod sometimes. And we're happy that you were willing and interested to take an interest in what both Nate and I have to say, and also just the way in which we like to play this game. Because we're super happy that you're taking an interest in CEDH, and we hope that perhaps you will find something here on your end. And um, yeah, other than that. Uh, I think that is going to be it. I'm going to let Pops know.